The Lord be with you. As you're turning in your copy of Holy Scripture to the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, I want to say a word about something I've meant to say for a couple of weeks now. Um, it is beyond encouraging, I think, when I look at the choir every Sunday morning and not only see the faces of adults, but children as well in our choir, which I think really puts me to shame because I'm sure they can carry a tune a whole lot better than I can. But I, I just think that's, that's wonderful. I hope you are encouraged by that as well, to see children in our choir, and adults of all ages, and maybe one day I'll, know, I'll look up here and see you in the choir. So uh, thank you, Linnell, for that. I'm sure Pat had nothing to do with it. It's like, yeah, it is a little bit. So. Well, this morning we are in the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, the beginning of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, and what we called in Sunday school the Beatitudes, uh, the Beatitudes this morning. Matthew chapter 5, reading verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, help us to hear what you would have us to hear, Lord, so that we may do what you call us to do, that we may be the people you are calling us to be. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray, amen. When I was little, we called it a number sign. The automated voice on the other end of the phone when I call about my car insurance, my bank account, or my student loan balance, it is a pound sign. Usually they say, please enter your account number followed by the pound sign. That's how it goes. I always thought, though, it looked like a blank, slightly slanted game of tic-tac-toe. Today, however, folks around the world know this little symbol comprised of two vertical parallel lines intersecting with two horizontal lines as a hashtag. It's a symbol used across social media platforms to categorize posts, tweets, pictures, a a sort of digital shorthand that labels such posts and even makes it easier to search for others who have used the same hashtag. For example, I'll give you an example. Next week is the Super Bowl and a lot of Atlanta Falcons fans have taken to using the hashtag rise up, just one word. So if I wanted to see what all the fans of the Falcons are talking about on social media, all I'd have to do is search for hashtag, pound sign, number sign, tic-tac-toe board, whatever you want to call it, hashtag, rise up. And I'd be able to see the thousands, if not millions, of posts on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and I'm sure there are others that even I'm too old to know about. Or or let's say I wanted to know what was going on during the Specialty Equipment Market Association show in Las Vegas. Everybody wants to know about that, right? All I'd have to do is search for hashtag SEMA, S-E-M-A. And I'd get pictures of the latest aftermarket performance parts, videos of new specialty vehicles from Chevrolet, Dodge, or Ford, stats about new high-performance hybrids, and all sorts of things. If I do it at the right time, I may even get a live feed video of an unveiling of something wonderful, like a new 
in intake manifold or something, you know, stuff that really gets you excited. I found this little symbol, the hashtag, to be useful too in trying to discern how large groups of people see certain subjects. I found that if I want to know how, how many people understand a particular matter, all I have to do is search for a hashtag. And there before me are thousands, if not millions, of filed opinions, posts, blogs, pictures, and articles, all with some connection to how folks understand the subject at hand. I'll give you another example. If you were to go on Instagram, a photo-sharing social media platform, and searched hashtag blessed, you might find the results interesting. I did. As of, well, when I checked, there were 66.2 million posts of people who used the hashtag blessed. Most of them were selfies. Everybody know what a selfie is? So when you take your own picture with your phone, you know, I guess it's short because self-portrait's too hard to say. Um, most of them are selfies. Folks wearing new clothes, new jewelry, maybe getting dressed, heading off to a job interview, maybe getting their braces on, maybe getting their braces taken off. Whatever it is, they all have the hashtag blessed. And then, then there are these countless pictures of new cars, usually nice cars, maybe the keys to a home, maybe some new jewelry. And I'm going to tell you, so many pictures of food. If people, I mean, I'm you, if people like to share with the world pictures of anything, it's food. They love to take pictures of what they had for lunch. And then there are all these pictures of palm trees, painted toenails in the sand, people lazily lounging on some beach in some exotic location, and every single one of them, all 66.2 million and change, all of them have the hashtag blessed. I can't help but wonder, though, is that what it means? Is that what it means to be hashtag blessed? To have new designer jeans, a new sports car, to have eaten the best omelet in the planet, on the planet. Are expensive exotic vacations really signs of divine favor and the outpouring of God's blessing? I can't help but wonder. Especially, especially in the light of Jesus' words that we've read this morning. Words many of us have no doubt heard more than once in our lives. They're words. Well, they're, they're words that almost read like a Twitter feed. I thought about that. The nine Beatitudes there. Maybe, maybe that's how Jesus would have started the Sermon on the Mount if he were beginning his ministry today. I can see it now. Matthew would tell us. Jesus saw the crowds. He went up the mountain. And after he sat down, the disciples came to him. And he pulled his iPhone from his pocket and began to teach them, tweeting, The poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hashtag blessed. Maybe he'd even attach a picture to the tweet. Uh, that, that iconic photo from Dorothea Lang of the migrant mother, uh, a poor victim of the Dust Bowl who moved to California with her seven children to pick peas in hopes of having enough to eat. I'm sure you've seen the picture, though you probably don't know what it's called. Woman there in her tattered clothes, brow furrowed, showing more than just the 32 years she had lived, and flanked on either shoulder by her exhausted, hungry children. Maybe that's what he would have done. A second tweet. Those who, will be, those who mourn will be comforted. Hashtag blessed. Maybe this time Jesus would share a link to the obituary page of a local newspaper highlighting one of the over 33,000 gun-related deaths in this country every year. Maybe. Maybe a third tweet. Attached is the video of Omran Daknish, the five-year-old Syrian boy pulled from the rubble of a bombed building and placed in the back of an ambulance. Disoriented and perhaps too used to such terror at such a young age, the age of five, Daknish, covered with dust, quietly just sort of looks around in a daze, before putting his hand to the sticky red wound on the side of his head. And Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Hashtag blessed. Maybe, maybe Jesus would change up platforms, diversify his outreach ministry, and take to Facebook. There he might share pictures from this past Friday. Because I assume if Jesus had Facebook, he'd be following our page. 
Images of young families, senior adults, single mothers, and disabled middle-aged men lining up in their cars, lining up in our back parking lot to receive a box of food and a bag of produce. Or maybe, maybe he'd share a link to the Feeding America website where one would find statistics like these. 42.2 million Americans, Americans lived in food insecure households. That's 29.1 million adults and 13.1 million children. Not in some sub-Saharan African country, not in some forgotten place in Eastern Europe, not somewhere in the jungles of South America, in the United States. 13.1 million children lived in food insecure households in 2015. Maybe. Perhaps he'd share these pictures and these statistics, and then he'd write, those who hunger and thirst will be filled. Hashtag blessed. Of course, sometimes one may choose to post something quite the opposite of the point one is making in order to emphasize the point itself, sort of to create a sense of dissonance that's obvious, almost sarcastic. For example, Jesus might have posted something like an image of the millions of refugees huddled in camps in Greece and a link to a news story on the most recent ban of such refugees entering the U.S. and then post, the merciful will receive mercy. Hashtag. Or he might share a picture of someone like Martin Shkreli, the CEO of the company Turing, which acquired the rights to the drug Daraprim, a sole source medication for toxoplasmosis that has been in circulation since 1953 and is used frequently by patients with comp compromised immune systems. When he got the rights to that drug, he upped the price from $13.50 per pill to $750 per pill. That's a 5,000% increase. He stood to make a fortune from those who desperately needed this medication, and he truly didn't care about the effects of such a dramatic increase. Maybe Jesus might have shared a picture of him, shared that story, then remind us all, it's the pure in heart who will see God. Hashtag blessed. Then perhaps Jesus would have taken to Instagram to post a collage of the crumbling, bombed-out buildings in Syria, along with the image of a boy soldier from Sierra Leone, and any one of the countless images of young homeless veterans on the street corners of our American cities, and along with these images, these words, the peacemakers will be called the children of God. Hashtag blessed. Maybe Jesus would even share those disturbing YouTube videos demonstrating the way Christians around the world are executed for their faith, the way they are imprisoned, tortured, and killed. Perhaps he'd share a quote from Hyun Soo Lim, a South Korean-born Canadian Presbyterian pastor who was imprisoned in a labor camp in North Korea simply for being there to aid in a humanitarian effort, arrested and sent to a labor camp just because he was doing what Jesus called him to do, to be there to help people. Maybe Jesus might share his picture. Those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hashtag blessed. Or maybe Jesus could have shared a screenshot of his own Facebook wall of all the posts of those spewing hatred and evil at him. Maybe he could have shown a snippet from an email he received from someone attempting to blackmail him, to complain to him, to spread awful lies and hate-filled rumors about him. Maybe he could have shared those sorts of things with a comment. People will revile you and persecute you and utter evil things against you on my account. They did the same thing to the prophets, and they were hashtag blessed. Now I know, and you know, Jesus didn't tweet the Beatitudes. And I know Christ didn't post them on a digital wall, share them on an app on his non-existent smartphone, or forward them through some massive group text. But the response to his words then would have been the same to such words now. For if Jesus did share such posts, marked with the hashtag bless, the comments refudiating such ideas would have gone on and on and on. No, Jesus, that's not what it means to be blessed. 
Blessed is to be on the beach. Blessed is to have a nice car. Blessed is to have a nice house. This is what blessed is, Jesus, not this stuff. That was what would have happened. After all, who in their right minds thinks being poor in spirit or otherwise is some sort of blessing from God? What fool would ever think mourning is something with which you have been blessed? Why on earth would we think someone who is meek would be blessed by God when bullies get to hold the highest offices and things get done when the mighty take the wheel? Who would ever think an empty, growling, distended stomach is a sign of God's favor? Or to be displaced from your home by war, to have the door shut in your face means God is with you. Who would have thought that? Why on earth would the merciful be blessed? The merciful, they're naive. They're gullible. They will always give in to even the most obvious sob story. That's not blessed. That's ignorant. Peacemakers. Peacemakers are too soft, too gentle. This world is a scary place. Too scary a place for peace. God obviously blesses might and power. Just look at the Old Testament. That's what they would have said then. And it's what people of faith say even today. But I want you to hear me, friend. It's wrong. The beatitude, the first public words of Jesus' ministry in Matthew's gospel. He doesn't say a single thing to the rest of the crowds until now. Show us the nature of God's kingdom. Jesus wanted to be sure from the get-go in Matthew to understand this is what the kingdom of God is about. They show us the upside-downness of the kingdom to which Christ calls us. It is a kingdom formed not in the shape of a crown, not in the shape of a throne or a conquering warrior. It is a kingdom formed in the shape of a cross. It's a kingdom not built on power, might, and strength, but a kingdom built on humility, compassion, and love. It is a kingdom that calls those who claim it to be people who bless the poor by helping them rise out of their poverty by walking alongside them, not condemning them and pointing fingers at them and accusing looks their way. It is a kingdom that calls its citizens to bless those who mourn, not with empty platitudes about the sweet by and by or about God needing a special angel so he picked yours, but by holding them up by giving them a shoulder to cry on, by crying with them, even if it takes the rest of our lives. It is a kingdom that calls us to bless the meek, to raise our voices with those whose voices cannot be heard because they have been drowned out by others in their lust for power. It is a kingdom that calls us to bless those who are hungry and thirsty, to give food and water without asking for papers or keeping track of how many times we've given it to them. It is a kingdom that calls us to bless the merciful, for the rest of the world doesn't have time for mercy. To bless the pure in heart, for theirs are the hearts that are most easily broken. To bless the peacemakers, for the world loves those who keep the peace by making everyone happy, but the world will crucify someone who seeks to make it, especially if we were the ones who disrupted it. It is a kingdom that calls us to bless the persecuted, the truly persecuted, for they endure the horror of a world's ignorance and sin. They endure the suffering of saints throughout the centuries, for they endure that pain and imprisonment and torture, and their heartbreak is piled all the more higher when others count themselves persecuted simply because they can freely practice their faith in the same zip code as somebody else. The upside-down kingdom of heaven outlined in the Beatitudes is one that calls us to be more than those who claim Christ with our hashtags and deny him with our actions. It is a kingdom whose king will say, come, you, I won't do this. you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then the Lord will say, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. That, my friends, is what it means to be 
Hashtag blessed. Let us pray. Gracious God, you call us, your people, to an upside-down kingdom. And Lord, I know those of us in this place, we love you and we believe that. And I know, God, that there are those who do not. We pray, Lord, for the strength to be your hands and feet. For the strength, God, to be you to those who so desperately need your love and your grace. Help us, God, to take your words here that you've given us so long ago, words that speak to us even sharply now. Help us to take them and make them a reality. To live beyond our hashtag. To live, or to live into the fullness of the love of your kingdom. So Holy Spirit, now even here in this place, if we have held on to something, some false way of thinking, we are blessed, some false understanding of the kingdom. God, help us to give it up. To turn it over to you now and to surrender fully to who you are and who you call us to be. Move among us, we pray, Holy Spirit, in the power of the name of our King, Lord Jesus. Amen.